Um, I'd like you, if you can, if you can, your, your, your Bibles, um, your Bibles to Romans, uh, Romans um, chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, and we're just going to talk a little bit about allowing uh, yourself, God bless you, Rav, God bless you, hallelujah, hallelujah, Kevin, hallelujah, hi Yvette, God bless you, God bless you, um, if you can open your, your Bibles to Romans 6, uh, Romans 6, and we're going to just uh, talk a little bit, uh, like I said, about uh, allowing ourselves, ourselves to, to be transformed, to be transformed, amen? Romans uh, chapter 6, uh, we'll just uh, read a portion, uh, 12, uh, verse 12 through 23. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, um, we read the word. Uh, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Uh, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law but under grace thank you jesus what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace by no means don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves you are slaves of the one you obey whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death, or you are slaves uh, to the one which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading holiness when you were slaves to sin you were free from the control of righteousness what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of those things result in death but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Thank you, Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God bless his holy word. As we just read in in Romans, in chapter uh, 6, if we take a look at verse 15, it says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And it answers that question immediately by saying, by no means. By no means. And today, we can continue to say, by no means. By no means. You see, in in this verse, Paul puts his finger on the scandal of grace. For grace 
became a scandal of sorts. And even today, we can see grace as a scandal of sorts. We can see people trying to use grace to justify their evil deeds, their wickedness. And that is not what grace is about. If God really does extend forgiveness to us, no matter what, why shouldn't we do whatever we please, knowing that all will be forgiven? That is how many still think, even today. Why can't we just do whatever we want? Why can't we continue to be evil? Why can't we continue to be wicked? What I'd like to share with you today is just the fact that someone is thinking this way tells us that they have not truly been saved. The fact that they're trying to use grace to justify their evil ways tells us that they're in a dark place. The fact that they are looking for some sort of an excuse to be able to be hurtful to others and yet not be punished tells us that they are in a dark place, but more than that, that they are far from God. That they have not truly received Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. Others may say that if the threat of punishment for lawlessness and the promise of reward for keeping the law has been removed, what incentive is there to live as God has called us to live? When we truly receive Jesus Christ into our hearts, by no means are we perfect but something truly happens on the inside and it reflects itself on the outside. Our internal process of salvation reflects itself externally. And so this is not about trying to find some sort of a shortcut. This is not about trying to find uh, some sort of a, a process of, 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 of justification the bad things we still want to do. When we come into an intimate relationship with God, we start to have a deep-rooted desire to want to do the right thing. So there's never a question of, of why can't I just do whatever I want since I'm going to be forgiven? There is never a question about why can I just continue to be lawless since there is a promise of a reward. The answer is that when we engage and we submit to the sovereign authority of God, when we truly receive, and I'm not talking about simply doing a sinner's prayer. I think people have done sinner's prayers all the time and it's done nothing for them. Nothing, but what I'm talking about is truly submitting to the sovereign authority of God. And that could come through a sinner's prayer if it is meaningful. If the person doing the sinner's prayer is truly humbling themselves and surrendering themselves to God, where they're not just interested in the process of justification and being forgiven, but they are interested in going through the process of regeneration, of growing in the Lord, and getting to that place of sanctification, being set apart to do God's will. They have a desire to go from point A to point Z. So for those who still ask those questions, I say, well, I guess there's no reason for it. 
See, but I, again, I say to you, that's the beauty of it. God loves us so much. It's really the only unconditional love. God's desire is to be in a relationship with us. What is our desire? Is our desire to be in a relationship with God? This is not about being threatened. This is not about going around and thinking that you're going to be hit by lightning. We hear those, those all the time. This is not about that. This is about you coming to a place where you finally recognize why you were created by God. You were created by God for God's purpose. And in order to engage that purpose, we must surrender to God. We must come to a place where we understand that we are no better than anyone else. But we are no worse than anyone else either. We must come to a place where we are appreciative of his grace. We are appreciative of his mercy, but we're not trying to take advantage of it. That's how bad things happen. And we've seen it through history. In verse 16, it says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or slaves to um, God, which leads to righteousness. When we dare, brothers and sisters, when we dare to trust God's grace, we cannot help but be transformed. It's a transformation that starts consciously, but it ends up being something that goes deeper than that. It becomes subconscious. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have plenty of people out there that are still worshiping God with only head knowledge. It's only conscious. Let me do this and let me do that. And that's okay. But at some point, you have to move to what we call heart knowledge of God. Where it becomes something subconscious. When you start doing things that are pleasing to God instinctively. You don't even have to think about it. It just, it just comes out that way. You see a situation, you see a, a, a tempting situation, and you say to yourself, that is not something that would please God. And so you don't engage in it. You find the situation where you can take advantage of someone, and yet you are stopped. You're stopped because something in you, without you even thinking about it, something in you tells you that is not the right thing to do. In verses 17 and 18, it says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be, used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So the word slave really depends on how you're using it, right? If we're talking about being slaves to the devil, we're talking about being slaves to sin, it's a horrible thing. But being slaves to God, our creator is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But here, it, here, here's the thing. God didn't create us as robots. We have freedom of will and freedom of choice and willful choice, as I like to say. And, and, and he wants us to come to him. By choice. Because we love God. I've said it before and I'll say it many times over before I leave this earth. I worship God out of appreciation for what he already did, not because of what 
he's going to do for me, if anything else. I, I, I worship God out of appreciation. I love him out of appreciation for what he did a little over 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross for me and for you so that we could have the chance, so we could get have the chance to get back to God's master plan so that we could have the chance at eternal life. True love, God's love, changes everything about us. I don't, I don't want to hear about this thing where, where, where somehow you have received Jesus Christ or, or you believe in Jesus Christ and God and or you go around, you know, strutting around with your, with your crucifix or your, 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 your chains and your T-shirts and bumper stickers and, and yet your actions say something totally different. Your, your, your bumper sticker says you love Jesus and your actions, actions say you love the devil. God's love changes everything in us. When you truly receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, the internal change can be seen externally, not only by yourself, but by others. You start to change the way you do things, the way you treat others, the way you speak to others. You can't say, I love Jesus and beat on your wife. You can't say, uh, I love Jesus and beat on your husband or beat on your partner. Your love for Jesus, if you find yourself in that circumstance or a similar circumstance, your love for Jesus will tell you, I need help. And then you go and you get it. And the same goes for any of our other issues in life. You could, you could be uh, an alcoholic. Uh, you could be dealing with uh, pornography. You could be dealing with all types of things. And, and, and your love for God and of God will tell you, I need help. And then you go and you get it. It's not about continuing to do things and continuing to do things and, and think, well, you know what? I'm saved by grace. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. It's plain. It's simple. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. And he won't be mocked either. The love of God, it, it has the power to to call us forth from death to life. In the same way that, that, that we read about the power of God calling forth Lazarus from the tomb, from death, that is the power of God. The power of God can call us as well from death, from the tombs we may find ourselves in into life. In verse 20, it says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Think about what it means, a slave, a person entirely under the domination of some influence or some person. So in other words, to be a slave to sin is to be under the domination or control of an influence which ultimately leads to death. And yet, to be a slave to God leads to righteousness and leads to life. In verse 22, it says, But now that you have been set free, free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. To be set free from sin is to be a slave to God and 
to be under the domination and influence of righteousness, which ultimately, as I said before, leads to eternal life in Christ Jesus. But we have to work at it. We have the work at it. There's a reason why uh, scripture says that we are God's greatest creation. As a matter of fact, as, as we find ourselves in, in this pandemic, you've been able to see it, right? You've been able to see what I've seen. You've been able to see the best that humanity has to offer. But you've also been able to see the worst that humanity has to offer. That's who we are. That's who we are as human beings. We can be incredibly influential in the things that are good and influential in the things that are not good. We can do amazing, amazing and beautiful works. And we can do some horrible things to one another. We must seek to be transformed. We, we must seek to be transformed. We must seek the face of God. Because therein lies the transformation that, spoke, that, that Paul is, is talking about. A transformation where each day we are influenced less by the things of this world and are influenced more by the things of God. Now, I know that you've read, we are in this world, but not in this world. See, understand that there are a lot of things in this world that we will partake in. It's part of life on this earth. But what we're talking about there is not doing, or doing our best not to partake in the things that don't honor God. And the things that don't honor God. And it starts with the little things. It starts with the little things. It starts with, with, with the young person taking a pen off his or her teacher's desk without permission. If we let that go, it leads to, 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 to greater things. And I mean on a, on a negative note. As, as parents, as parents, if, if you find out that this is what your child has done, you must correct them immediately. Just as God corrects us, his children. And the Bible is full of correction. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. The Bible is a spiritual mirror. It's a spiritual mirror. When you look into it, it'll show you how beautiful you are, but also show you how ugly you can be or how ugly you've become. But it's not to shame you, but to teach you. To teach you about repentance, about turning it all around and heading back in the right direction. So I guess the question is, why is this transformation so important? And so in Romans 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. We're talking about life or death here, people. But the gift of God is eternal. Eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord, it says. See, this transformation, brothers and sisters, it allows us to, to be in this world and yet not take part in a lot of things that this world offers. We learn to, to seek out what is right and to avoid that which is wrong. We make that part of, of our daily lives from the moment we wake up to the moment we fall asleep. 
This transformation that we're talking about today allows us to even lead others to Christ. This is not about going out there and, 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 and constantly preaching a sermon. As a matter of fact, more people are led to, led to Christ through the actions of others than through the words. A combination thereof is great. Oh, but how many times have people been led astray by words and emotions and feelings? And yet when they are able to see the change that Jesus Christ has done in you, it makes them curious. They too want to know. And there is a door opening. This transformation allows us to uh, believe in and wait upon the promises made by the master. Sometimes we can become tired of waiting for the promises that we read about in the Bible. But when you have truly been transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit, you gain patience. You wait on the Lord. You learn what it is to be still and know that he is God. And that is so important nowadays. That is so important where people right now are, are feeling a, a little bit uh, disheveled and, 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 and disheveled and, and, and feeling that 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 they're losing control. When God transforms us, even when things around us seem chaotic, even we, when, when we are experiencing desperation, we still depend on the Lord. We are patient and we depend on the Lord. We need more of that today, brothers and sisters. We need so much more. So how do we check? How do we check this transformation in our lives? I mentioned it before and I'll say it again, and I'll end with this. By looking in the spiritual mirror, the word of God, be surprised how many people who consider themselves Christians do not read their Bibles consistently. They do not seek the answers to their questions through the word of God, the solution to their problems through the word of God. Brothers and sisters, if there were ever a time to be transformed, it's now. If there were ever a time for you to not only be reading your Bible, but studying the word of God in depth, it is now. And there, like I said, we see whether we are truly being imitators of Christ Or are we being imitators of the devil? In that spiritual mirror, we see ourselves for who we truly are. Are we imperfect human beings trying to serve a perfect God? Or are we imperfect human beings trying to get our way and to use our God? We cannot continue to straddle the line. See, the way it works is that if we are on God's side, then we are on God's side. If we are on the world's side, then we are on the devil's side. And if we straddle the line, then we are automatically on the world's side, on the devil's side. See, the God that I serve is a God that is not going to share his kingdom or his throne with anyone. He is a jealous God, a God who, who, who will not play second fiddle to anyone. God wants his appropriate place in our lives. 
And that means at the center of our lives, where everything in our lives or about our lives revolves around God. And it's then that we experience transformation. It is then when we can be led to the promised land.